not whom I, how I have believed. We just don't understand the do doctrine of election, how it is that God works in our hearts, moves us by the Spirit of God, causes us to respond to the Word of God when we were dead in trespasses and sins. And that gives us an introduction to our second half of predestined storms in our lives. Tonight we want to talk about the theological underpinnings, the, the doctrine of predestination and election, and how it relates to the storms that God brings into our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. Last week we had part one of predestined storms in our lives. Tonight we have predestined storms in our lives part two. Our text is Acts chapter 27. I'll begin reading in verse 13 if you'd like to follow along. Acts chapter 27. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand strake sail and so were driven and we being exceeding tossed with the tempest the next day they lightened the ship the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this arm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's word. Again, may he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for the predestined storms that you have brought into our lives, for our good and for your glory for a testimony to those who are lost and a demonstration that you, the sovereign God of the universe, control not only men and angels, but even the elements of the world itself. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon the word as it goes forth tonight, that you will glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in it, that those who are here and listening over the Internet will be edified, and that in all things Jesus Christ might be exalted and have the preeminence, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Now, as we said last week, the Word of God guarantees that we'll go through storms in our lives, not just the physical storms, but the things that test us and that refine us for the glory of Christ. The will of God is, and it declares it so in the Scripture, the will of God is for us to go through times of testing, specifically to purify our lives before God sends us His blessing. There always has to be a time of testing before blessing. God wants to make sure that we pass the test before we get the A on a report card. God wants to make sure that we've gone through all the different courses that are necessary in life, <clears throat> the different types of trials, so that when we graduate, we'll do so with honors because he has made it possible. Now, as we said last week, we're not talking about the storms that come into our lives because of our own stupidity or because of our rebellion, or our stubbornness, or our sloth, or our self-will, or our bullheadedness. We're talking about suffering that comes to us 
when we are focused on doing the will of God for our lives. That's the time that he's putting us to the various tests because we are headed in the right direction. Because he is chiseling away the things that will not fit in the perfect plan that he has for each one of us. We saw Peter saying in 1 Peter 2.19, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endures grief, suffering wrongfully. And we gave a lot of different illustrations of godly men and godly leaders throughout scripture who have suffered for what was doing right. We looked at the examples of Nehemiah and Job and we saw there are different levels of suffering. We find level one, which is the mockery and the scorn and the shame. And as you go through scripture, you discover that each of the men of God who is going to go on a path of suffering reaches that level one first, where people begin to mock and scorn before they do anything physical against the individual. You'll discover that in your own life, and that's where most of us turn back. Most of us turn back at level number one, which is when people begin to mock us, or ridicule us for our faith. We begin to try to blend into the woodwork. We begin to try to fade away where nobody really knows that we're there, where we just sort of fit in with the crowd. If God has a purpose for your life, he's going to continue to bring that kind of suffering until you learn to stand up to the pain so that he can transform you into the image of Christ. Because that is his purpose. You know, we've talked about the purposes of God. We've talked about the goals that he has for us in life. To transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Suffering is part of that. We looked at the events of Daniel. We looked at the events of the captivity. We looked at the suffering of righteous people as our example. We looked how the good suffered right along with the wicked. Who had brought on the judgment of God on their nations. We looked at national kinds of suffering. We looked at the prophets who are given to us for an example according to James chapter 5. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. We looked at the heroes of faith who are our example and Hebrews chapter 11 gives us many illustrations of that. The heroes of faith went through suffering. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted. They were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And the phrase in the middle of all that that is so beautiful, of whom the world was not worthy. The world thought that they weren't worth anything, but it was the world that wasn't worth anything. The world wasn't even worth having those heroes of faith in their midst. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Not just the heroes of faith in the first half of Hebrews 11, who had all the great victories. The list is not complete without us in the second half of the list as well. We all want to be in the first half. But a complete list includes believers who have suffered for their faith. I had thought about bringing in a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs and giving you some illustrations of those who from the times of the early church down until that book was written suffered for their faith. It's an incredible read. I actually have bought, maybe I shouldn't say it over the internet but I'll tell you anyway, I don't think my kids are listening in tonight. I bought a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs for each one of them as a Christmas present because we're going into days that are coming ahead of us in which I think some of us are going to have to suffer in some rather gruesome ways for our faith in Jesus Christ. We saw how Jesus is our example. He suffered death, crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. We saw his suffering when they nailed him to the cross, platted the crown of thorns and placed it on his head, beat him and hit him and spit on him. We saw other believers who are our example. In Acts chapter 7 verse 6, 
speaking of Israel in the Old Testament, and then in Acts chapter 26, 11, where the Apostle Paul talks about how he persecuted believers in every synagogue and tried to get them so he could put them to death. And then we look finally at one of the most important key passages dealing with suffering. And I'm going to read that again for us over in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, because this is what gives us the introduction for tonight. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. The first principle that we learned there was God brings suffering into our lives to stop us from sinning. Now, someone who is sharp might pick up on that and say, wow, if I don't want to suffer that kind of suffering, I'm going to stop sinning before I suffer it. That's a good idea. You'll still get the second kind of suffering. Remember, the first kind of suffering is for our stupidity. The second kind of suffering comes to those who are seeking by their life to live for Christ. So you can't escape suffering. You can escape the first kind, which is suffering for your own stupidity and for your own sin. Because suffering does produce that result. It stops you from sinning. Peter says that in verse 1. That he should know in verse 2, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Second principle we learned was suffering is designed to conform us to the will of God. And then he describes what our lives used to be like in verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wines, revelings, banquings, and abominable idolatries. Now, I hope you picked up as I was reading through the passage tonight where it says they thought that they had obtained their purpose, then they let loose and set sail away from Crete. They thought they were going to attain their purpose. But when men try to attain their purpose, what is the sovereign purpose that is overriding all of the purposes of men? The will of the Gentiles is one thing. The will of God is a different thing. The third thing that we learned was if you live a godly life, people are going to think you're weird. When they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. When they do, don't worry about it. You know, when things like that come, and every day I say this little phrase over and over when I see stupid things that are being done, not just out there in the general public, but things that frustrate me here in the church, and I think about it for a moment, the petty little things, the little foxes that spoil the vines, I say, it doesn't matter. Keep moving. Because I could spend my entire life eaten up with the petty things that people do around here. Got to keep moving. Got to keep the eyes on the goal. Got to keep focused on the purpose. Got to keep moving. Every little thing that I take care of during life has to reach toward that goal. And things that will distract from that goal, I try to set them aside. I try not to pay attention to them. I try to ignore them. I try to keep moving forward. That's what we all have to do. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the get? God will take care of those people. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Principle number four. You better pay attention because we're coming down to the wire. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. That's principle number five. Is love of the brethren. Oh, we could spend a lot of time. First, second, and third John have a lot to say about that. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That's agape love. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, every person in this place who's a believer has received the gift of hospitality. It says so right there. We talked about that in detail some months ago when we covered the spiritual gifts. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Your home does not belong to you. It belongs to Christ. You're a steward of it. 
If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. He's going through different spiritual gifts here. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes back to suffering. He's talked about believers, how believers are supposed to function in the context. Starts with suffering, how believers are supposed to respond. How believers are supposed to act toward one another. How believers are supposed to respond to the world around them. Then he goes back to suffering. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. That should be our response. Not moaning and groaning, not kicking and whining, not fussing and complaining. It should be exceeding joy. Because we are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That's when you're suffering for righteousness. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. You know when that happens? There is a something invisible that is taking place right then in your life. You can't see it, but God can see it. The holy angels can see it. I suspect also the demonic forces can see it. It says so right here. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. When you're suffering for righteousness, that is what is taking place in the invisible realm. The spirit of glory, the spirit of God is resting on you. What is the spirit of glory? We were talking about it this morning. It's not visible to you right now, but it's the Shekinah glory of God. The spirit of glory is resting upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of. Remember, that's level number one. That's all the criticisms and ugly things. But on your part, he's glorified. But don't suffer for your own stupidity. Verse 15. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Some of you folks are busybodies. I love you, but you do. I've seen it over the last eight and a half, almost nine years now. You always got to dig into what everybody else is doing and find out all the dirt about them. And then you gossip, and then you spread it around, and it really gets out of proportion, and I hear about it. Believe me, I hear about it. It gets back to me, and oh, I just groan in my spirit, and I pray for you. Some of you are busybodies. Notice the category that puts you in. Same category as murderers, thieves, and evildoers. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, here's where we are to suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that, wow, this is why you don't want to suffer as a murder, thief, evildoer, or busybody. The time has come that judgment must begin, where? At the house of God. God cleans up his own house first. He will judge the world. But God cleans up his own house first. Judgment must begin, must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, he's not talking about some other church. He's even including himself. It begins with him. That's why he wants to make sure his act is straight. Why he wants to make sure that our act is straight. If it first begin at us, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, that indicates some pretty stiff chastening. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Too many people take that lightly. Then back to the theme. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator, the God who made us, the God who sustains us, is the God who will bring us through the times of testing when we are suffering for righteousness' sake. We close with two verses, 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And Hebrews 10.36, For ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Suffering, fulfillment of the will of God, promised blessing. That's the order 
in scripture for those who receive the blessing of God you say I want the blessing of God then understand there's a process that you have to go through there is suffering for righteousness there is placement in the center of God's will there is reception of blessing and reward now so tonight we're talking about part two predestined storms in our lives so let's talk about for a moment predestination election and the sovereignty of God that will help us to understand who the storms of life will affect now I'm going to give you a real basic quick but essential summary first of the doctrine of election then how does election relate to predestination and then we'll talk about the sovereignty of God in the storms of life but first we're going to talk about election I want to start with the term elect so if you're taking notes there are seven different ways in the Bible that the word elect is used in every one of the seven cases it refers to a choice that God himself is making not a choice that you make but a choice that God himself makes choosing either an individual or a group for a specific purpose which he has preordained so election deals with God making choices that are related to specific purposes that he has preordained purpose of God is one very important doctrine election is another important doctrine predestination is another important doctrine sovereignty of God is another important doctrine they're all related but they're not identical foreknowledge is also in there we've talked about that in the past and I may bring that up in a future message but tonight we're talking about the doctrine of election so let's begin with the elect the seven different ways that the term elect is used in scripture first and most people don't recognize this but the term elect is used of the Lord Jesus Christ did you know that the term elect is used of Christ now we've already seen how the storms of life affected him for living a righteous life but first the term elect is used of Christ let me give you a couple of references one in the Old Testament one in the New Testament the first is Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1 behold my servant whom I uphold mine elect in whom my soul delighteth I have put my spirit upon him he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles this is quoted in the Gospels as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ he's called my servant whom I uphold mine elect in whom my soul delighteth I have put my spirit upon him he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles so we find it prophetically used of Christ in Isaiah 42 then we find it specifically applied to Christ in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6 wherefore also it is contained in the scripture behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded Peter's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ is referred to as the one who is God's elect second number two the term elect is used of the holy angels in contrast to the fallen angels or the demons the term elect is used of the holy angels in contrast to the demons first Timothy chapter 5 verse 21 Paul is giving a charge it's a military command word that's used there it's something where the soldier says yes sir and has to obey I charge thee and the witnesses to the charge are the following I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels the angels are called elect that thou observe these things without preferring one before another doing nothing but partiality Timothy was a young pastor A young evangelist a church planter Paul says you can't play favorites you can't give more attention to one than you do to the others you can't treat 
with better benefits the people who are nice than you give to those who are not so nice. But in that context, he calls a certain group of angels the elect angels. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things. Those three are categories of witnesses who are watching whether or not Timothy will do what he's been commanded to do. We have a couple of observations about this. Observation number one. Remember, we're talking about election and its relation to suffering. We need to note that we're not told of any suffering that the elect angels are to go through, and there's a reason for that. Number one, because they are neither sinners, or number two, neither are they substitutes for sinners. Angels didn't die for you. If, as the Jehovah's Witness say, that Christ is Michael the Archangel, then there would make no sense because the elect angels have nothing said about them concerning suffering. Christ is a substitute for sinners. That's why he had to suffer. Believers are sinners for whom the substitution was made. And therefore we suffer because we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. Observation number two. Christ did not die for angels. Christ died for people. The fallen angels must pay for their own sins, and they will, just as humans who are non-elect must suffer the consequences for their own sins. Remember, the suffering we're talking about is suffering for righteousness. Fallen angels will never suffer for righteousness. Now we come down to the third use of the term elect. Number three, the term elect is used of Israel in the Old Testament. The term elect is used of Israel in the Old Testament. Again, we find all three of the usages, the primary usages of that term in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has a lot of incredible stuff in it. Isaiah 45 verse four is the first reference. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. I have called, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. In other words, an election that takes place before someone comes to know the true God. But Israel is clearly called the elect. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Second place that we find Israel, national Israel, elect, that term being used in the Old Testament, as Isaiah chapter 65, verse 9. Isaiah 65, 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there promises that God is making to national Israel that relate to their election. Their election in the Old Testament is not as the bride of Christ, but as the wife of Jehovah. Two distinct terms. One is used of Israel in the Old Testament. One is used of the church in the New Testament. Last passage to look at is Isaiah 65, 22. They shall, build, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. He's talking about the millennial reign of Christ when Israel is dwelling in the land of Israel. So the closing chapters of Isaiah are dealing with that issue. The fourth way in which the term elect is used. Number four. The term, of, uh, term elect is used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. The term elect is used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. You can pray for me about something that I'm pondering what to do next. In light of current events, we may begin a study of the book of Revelation when we're finished with the book of Acts. I haven't really made a final decision on that yet. There are a couple of things that have been pushing back and forth in my spirit as to what should be next after the book of Acts, because we're almost to the end of the book of Acts. But elect is used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. Our Lord Jesus Christ used it that way. For example, in the um, 
sermon that he gives in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Mount of Olivet Discourse. Chapter 24, verse 22, and then I'll read verse 24 and then verse 31. All of those are in the same context. Jesus says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Now the church is already out of here, so the elect that we're talking about here, the rapture has already occurred before the tribulation takes place. The elect that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 24 are those who are in Israel, in the land of Israel, who are Jews during the tribulation period when the Antichrist sets up his seat in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, by which he implies it is not possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Satan is a master counterfeiter. During the tribulation period, you know, there is the Antichrist, there is the false prophet. The image of the beast is going to be made to speak. It's going to be like it's alive. The false prophet is going to be able to do miracles like were done in the Old Testament. The whole world is going to wonder when the, the beast is slain and then raised from the dead in imitation of the resurrection of Christ. Oh, but those who have the word of God, who are the Jews, there are going to be those who are among them who are the elect, and they will not be deceived. But it will be so deceptive that possibly even the elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. And then verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. Here we are at the end of the tribulation. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Because remember what Jesus told them to do when they saw the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place, let him that is in, you know, that reads understand. He says, if you are... You know, on the housetop, don't go down and get your cloak, run. You know, if you're out in the field, don't go back, run. Pray that you're not pregnant during that time, run. Because it's going to be the worst tribulation that anybody's ever seen in all the world. The worst persecution that the Jews have ever suffered in all the history of earth. We get over to Mark chapter 13. Again, we find in Mark the same set of verses. Verse 20, And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. That's tribulation period context. Verse 22, For false Christ and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Verse 27, And then shall he send his angels, and he shall gather his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. That brings us to our fifth use of the term elect. The fifth use of the term elect. It's used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. Elect is used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. Jesus speaking, verse Luke chapter 18, verse 7. <clears throat> and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? <laughs> which means... He's putting up with us. But he still hears us when we cry. We don't deserve it. He has to put up with us. He has to bear long with us. But he hears us when we cry. Number six. The term elect is used of believers in the church age. Number six. The term elect is used of believers in the church age. And this will be principally where we are focused when we look at the elect in relation to suffering. <clears throat> and there are many passages that deal with this, but I'll give you a few. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Remember, that takes us back to level one of suffering. And we'll talk about that more, the Lord willing. But who's going to lay anything to your charge? You're among the elect. Because it is God who justifies. Do you remember the difference between justification and imputation, I hope? Justification is God declares us righteous because we are in Christ. It is God that justifies. So who's going to lay anything to your charge? Because it is God who's declared you righteous. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. There are some responsibilities that go along with election. Election. 
there are some manifestations in the life of the believer that will show up if you are among the elect. We find it in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. <clears throat> and here's the position of the elect, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercies. Merciful emotions. Not hard hearts. Not where you stiff arm the brethren who have a need. Bowels of mercies. Kindness. How often we are unkind. We have a vendetta. We want to get even. We want to get back at somebody who we think has done something to us and we'll show them. We'll teach them a thing or two. Are you among the elect? You know what's supposed to characterize you? Merciful emotions. Kindness. Here's one. Humbleness of mind. Paul also says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Humbleness of mind is one of the character qualities of Christ. Are you among the elect? These are things that are going to show up in your life. You're reformed. You believe in the doctrines of the sovereignty of God and in election. Theology is not enough unless it changes your life. What you really believe will be demonstrated by the way in which you live. Those two things always go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. Did you know that that is one of the manifestations of those who are elect? Meekness. Meekness is power under control. Meekness is not an explosive display of power. It's where when you could use power, you choose instead to serve. And the last one certainly fits the list. Long-suffering. Difference between patience and long-suffering I've taught you in the past. Patience is putting up with difficult Circumstances, good for you, right. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. <laughs> Circumstances versus people. Two different Greek words, and they are in different contexts in Scripture. Patience deals with your circumstances of life. Long-suffering deals with the difficult people that all of us come into contact with day by day. If you're among the elect... These are things you are to put on as the elect of God. Now you're holy, now you're beloved, but here's what you're to put on. Bowels of mercies, the merciful emotions. Kindness. Humility, humbleness of mind. Meekness. Long-suffering. Yes, the term elect is used to believers in the church age, but it's used in a practical sense, not merely in a theological box. Now we find elect in the context of suffering, but not merely for our own sakes, but for the sakes of others. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul didn't know which ones were the elect. He preached the gospel indiscriminately. He lived for Christ without shame openly because he did not know who would respond. But he knew there were some elect ones out there. And so he was willing to suffer for their sakes that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We find that election is tied to faith in Titus chapter 1. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, 
Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. A body of truth and a response to that body of truth. The elect will have a body of truth to which they have responded. The faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Ah, it changes lives. Godliness is a lifestyle. And then Peter speaks of elect in the context of several other doctrines that deal with the sovereignty of God. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Election is a work that ties us to all three members of the Trinity. God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ. That brings us to seven. The term elect is used to describe local churches composed of true believers. The term elect, this is number seven, is used to describe local churches composed of true believers. John uses it this way in his epistles. 2 John chapter 1, verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. And we see that this is indeed a local church that he's talking to because he uses the term again much more clearly in verse 13, same chapter. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Now we have to do some subcategories at this point. So we're going to look at the term election, which falls into four different categories. The first category of the word election, now we've moved from elect to election. The first category, the term election is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. Election is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. Israel and the church are not the same. Romans chapter 11, verse 28. Paul has been talking about the Jews to whom all these things have been committed and how they've blown it. He says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election... They are beloved for the Father's sake. In other words, God still has a plan for them. Even though right now they've rejected Christ, God has a plan for that group, for national Israel, that he will still fulfill. Right now they're enemies of the gospel. But according to the election, they are still beloved by God. The second category Second category where the term election is used, it's used in the New Testament to distinguish believing Jews from non-believing Jews. First we saw national Israel contrasted with the church. Now we see believing Jews contrasted with non-believing Jews and the term election used for those who are believing Jews. This also is in Romans, back a few verses, back in Romans 11.7. This is the distinction between national Israel as a group contrasted with specifically chosen Jews whom God has chosen for salvation. Romans 11.7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Judgmental blindness. We've discussed judgmental blindness. In fact, we spent several weeks talking about that uh, a number of weeks ago as we were going through the, the plagues, the judgmental blindness that God sent on, on Egypt. But here he's been talking in the context about Israel. National Israel, a lot of them rejecting, but some of them trusting Christ and being saved. And so he contrasts the non-believing Jews with those who are the believing Jews and calls the believers the election and the rest were blinded. The third category in which we find the term election, and our time is running out, the term is ele election is used of individual believers in the church age. The term election is used of in individual believers in the church age. For example, we see that over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. 
Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. These are Gentiles. These are people of Thessalonica. And Paul uses a very interesting word to start with. He says, knowing, brethren, beloved. How did he know? How did Paul know that they were among the elect? Well, if you read 1 Thessalonians, you'll discover very quickly that their, their faith was known throughout all the world. They had clear manifestations, not of a theological doctrine, but the way in which they lived. Remember, we were talking just a few minutes ago about certain character qualities that will show up in the life of a believer. When you read 1 Thessalonians, you discover that those are character qualities that the church of Thessalonica had. And so Paul can says, say, knowing, brother beloved, your election of God. He had no question that they were among God's elect. So that category, number three, is election used of individual believers in the church age. Fourth category. <laughs> now here we have another subdivision. But the fourth category is the essential character qualities to election. The essential character qualities to election. The doctrine itself. Not the people who are elect, but the doctrine of election. And there are three essential character qualities. So category four is the essential character qualities of election. There are three character qualities to the doctrine of election. Number one, the first element. The first element is that election is not based on works. Election is not based on works. Speaking of Jacob and Esau, the Apostle Paul, in those great chapters, Romans 9, 10, 11, where he discusses the doctrine of election and predestination and the sovereignty of God and all of that. The first element, election is not based on works. Romans chapter 9, verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God didn't look down the corridors of time and say, well, this guy's going to be good and this guy's going to be bad, and so I'll choose the guy that's going to be good. Because Jacob was a scoundrel, and God chose Jacob. Esau had a lot more going for him physically than Jacob did, but God chose Jacob. He says specifically, election is not of works. And election relates to the purposes of God. The second element First element, not of works. Second element of election, it is clearly stated that election is based on grace. Romans chapter 11, verse 5. Election based on grace. Even so then, at this present time, there also is a remnant according to, now listen, the election of grace. It's not based on works, very clearly stated. It is, uh, not based on works, clearly say it is based on grace. There is a remnant, not a lot, but a remnant. Remember, we've talked about the remnant principle. At every age in the history of the world, God has always had a remnant who have been faithful to him. Not based on their works, but based on God's grace. God reached down and saved them in the midst of the horrible situation of earth in which they were living, like Noah. Noah found what in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. It is an election of grace in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God saved eight people on the whole face of the planet. That was the second element. Election is based on grace, Romans 11.5. The third element, and this is the one that's hard for us to understand, but we need to get it. Election does not negate human responsibility. Election does not negate human responsibility. Peter states that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, now listen, give diligence. That means you're going to be doing something. You're not going to be doing it slothfully. You're not going to be doing it haphazardly. You're not going to be doing it lazily. You're going to be doing something diligently. You'll give diligence to something. Give diligence 
to make your calling and election sure. Whoa. But I thought it was based on grace, yeah. It's not based on works, yeah. But did you know that doesn't negate your human responsibility? Remember we talked about there are certain character qualities that those who are among the elect will be manifesting clearly and visibly so others can see. So that Paul say, knowing your election, that those things will be visible in the life of the believer. We talked about this when we talked about faith. What is genuine faith? Genuine faith always, not sometimes, genuine faith always produces works of righteousness. Why? Because genuine faith is tied to election. And the elect will always manifest certain character qualities because the Spirit of God is transforming them, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, transforming us into the image of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the elect, the precious, the chief cornerstone. I hope you see how these things tie together. Because ultimately, it all brings the glory back, not to us, but it brings the glory back to God. And in particular, it brings the glory to Christ. Election does not negate human responsibility. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence. Pay attention to this. Start putting it into practice to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do, not if you believe these things in your head in some categorical theological box. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Ah, the practical application of election is it goes back to the business of keeping you from sin and what does God use in our lives to eradicate sin? Suffering. You see, this entire thing is tied together. There are no loose ends anywhere. They all come back to the sovereign purposes of God which are to conform us to the image of Christ, which means to burn the sin out of our lives and to make us reflect his glory before a watching world who hates us. And the more we show Christ, the more they will say bad things about us. And the more we show Christ, the more they will do bad things to us and may even give us a head start to glory. For if you do these things, you shall never fail or never fall. Well, we're past time. Lord willing, we'll try to study election next week in relation to predestination and then make application to the storms in our lives. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How everything fits together when we look at it carefully because you're a God of precision. You're a God of grace. And though our salvation and our election is not based on our works, Yet, our salvation and our election will be manifested by our works because the Spirit of God is working in our lives. The Spirit of glory and of God will rest upon us and it will show, demonstrate visibly to all those who are watching that we are yours. Who are the chosen ones to whom you have given salvation that we did not deserve. It was a matter of your grace. So, Father, once again, we thank you for what we've studied tonight. We pray that you'll help us to see how true doctrine, accurately applied, always produces life-changing results in the life of the believer. To the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.